epistle for this fourth Sunday in Advent is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Brethren, let a man so account us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now here it is required in stewards that a man be found trustworthy. But with me it is a very small matter to be judged by you or by man's tribunal. Nay, I do not even judge my own self. For I have nothing on my conscience, yet I am not thereby justified. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore pass no judgment before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness and make manifest the counsels of hearts. And then everyone will have his praise from God. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was procurator of Judea, and Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother Tetrarch of the district of Eturia, Traconitis, Elisanias Tetrarch of Abilina, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zachary, in the desert. And he went into all the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the desert, Make ready the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked way shall be made straight, and the rough way smooth, and all mankind shall see the salvation of God. Those are the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this Mass is offered for the worthy intentions of Bob Nurban. Earlier, um, in the earlier part of the history of the church, the Saturday of the third week of Advent, which would be yesterday, was set aside for the ordination of priests and they had no Mass on uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent at all because it, I guess the celebrations just went too far uh, into the next day. But then later on in the church's history, a Mass was added on Sunday for those who weren't able to be at the big ordination Mass. And then eventually the opportunity was taken in the gospel, for there be one last call to repentance, to a real and lasting change on the inside, a metanoia, a change of a person, uh, the whole attitude, the outlook, disposition and behavior that would uh, be developing, but at the same time that would endure, that would last. Now the epistle today, was especially directed towards the new priests. Uh, so Paul speaks of ministers of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. Mysteries is the early word for sacraments. So in the gospel, we see that John is uh, using a baptismal ritual, which was not unheard of in, amongst the Jewish rites and customs. And uh, it could be, in those rites and customs, it could be received more than once. Uh, John, John the Baptist, however, his baptism was given only once. He's pointing to, he's a type of, obviously, the baptism that we have in Christ's church, which is given only once 
because it gives a permanent seal through the power of God on the person, uh, the soul of the person, you might say kind of a beachhead, so to speak, of the forces of light within the person. So we could ask why the detailed chronology of rulers. Half this passage is talking about these petty rulers, and Tiberius wasn't a petty ruler, but the other ones were puppet rulers, kings in Palestine. Why go through all of that? Uh, it's, we can understand it somewhat in the case of Jesus and his birth, but why, uh, why about John? And besides placing it, and by the way, I don't find any commentary in what I have on the church fathers that they ever really said anything particular other than that they were trying to pin down and establish the date, but they don't say why, because apparently they didn't know. So I'll take a guess, being willing to walk through a minefield, I'll take a guess, say that maybe it was to show that God's kingdom and his will proceeds above and, and without dependency on earthly rulers. It's a story with a capital S into which we are summoned. We're summoned to enter this story, the unfolding of God's providence through time. And uh, it's a story that, that will last, continues on for eternity. And yet it proceeds within and among the kingdoms of earth. It proceeds in the context of space and time. But God's providence is sure and it is simple and it will bring to bear fruit uh, where people are receptive to it. So we're called, in other words, to step up to actions and disciplines that may not and today definitely do not correspond with the priorities or programs of governments, societies, or other associations within our world. The building of God's kingdom goes on with, within willing souls through the action of the Holy Spirit. It's a kingdom that is visible to this world, that we have churches, uh, and those are visible. The kingdom is invisible to this world. Catholic social doctrine tells us that government should support conditions such as public order, rule of law, and even instruction in the faith, the Catholic faith, uh, in order to make conditions that are right for virtue, building virtue, building character, as they like to say nowadays. Public order, the rule of law, and things like that. That a Catholic, in other words, cannot be a revolutionary as it is commonly understood in these days. <clears throat> Father Gabriel says that if, if our valleys you know, John talks about valleys and mountains and hills. Our valleys could be seen as our own deficiencies. Each person has their own deficiencies or vulnerabilities. They're to be filled up by God's love. But if that's going to happen, then the mountains and hills, that is our vain pretensions of pride, must be made low by humility. Father Gabriel says, a heart filled with self-love and pride cannot be filled with God, and too small will be the place reserved in it for the sweet babe of Bethlehem. John speaks also of, uh, on a level of the entirety of human history, salvation history, and societies or civilizations. He's basically saying in more modern terms, God will work a great reversal or a remake uh, of all creation that will stun those who in these days think that they are in charge of the world. And it will, uh, it will shock them 
uh, those who think they have the option of forcing a great reset on the world that will uh, touch and control all aspects of human life. In other words, the modern totalitarianism, um, you know, which is an attempt, as it's always an attempt, to replace God. All of which indicates to us that the great story is the real story. It's real history. And it will go on till Judgment Day, regardless of how many resetters, great resetters, every age, every, of, every century brings to the world. We see that the true meaning of all our thoughts and our words and our deeds come from their correspondence or not with a divine, uh, uh, can't read it, <laughs> with a divine law and with divine providence. Everything in life, with the possible exception of whether or not we prefer mustard or ketchup on a hamburger, uh, every, occasion, every um, uh, decision in life, every occasion making a free, rational decision is an opportunity to affirm or deny the truth of Jesus Christ. It may not go in exactly those words, but that is what it amounts to. I can illustrate what I'm trying to convey by talking about the priesthood. The priest is a priest. He is not a presider. The culture says you're a presider. You're just ga helping gather people around. A priest is one who offers sacrifice by definition. That's what he does. Preaching in uh, is included as a very important job of a priest. But the pre everything he does and everything he is should be oriented towards offering the sacrifice of a mass. That's the center and the source of all of the grace in the world is the center and the summit of our, our faith. The calling of a priest uh, is, is that way. Deacons, permanent deacons in these days are also called to preach. There is a difference. Deacons don't offer sacrifice. Priests do. The context in which a priest works is, of course, always the church. Our whole lives should be considered as part of the life of the church because that's exactly what it is. Can construction of Jesus Christ's presence in the world over his continuation, the church is a continuation of Jesus Christ's presence in the world over space and time, and especially in the Eucharist. The priest should not go simply to hear confessions. He should go to cleanse souls and to help people to roll back the darkness that would envelop them. And so the priest should ask questions. He should engage with the penitent. Does not real personal questions, but ask more for clarification. Ask questions that may be things that the, the uh, penitent has not thought of. You know, a lot of people go through life and they've got these grudges and they've got these uh, uh, annoyances and maybe areas where they've been a little slack and they hardly even think about it. And so it's certainly true of me, it's certainly true of most people. Got things that we just hardly think about. The priest should ask. The idea is to cleanse our soul. I have to, uh, I have to say some years back, somebody took issue with me as a priest because I asked questions. They said, you can only ask questions about things that, I, that the penitent has mentioned in a confession. I said, no, you've been watching too many Law and Order episodes. That's a rule of cross-examination in a court of law. That is not what a priest is for. A priest is not here to bandy words with you. A priest is there to bring a cleansing uh, through the action, of course, of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And the priest should seek out 
other priests who believe the same thing so that he may make a confession, his own confession, to such priests. In short, our Lord Jesus invites each of us into the story that goes on and will, if we ask, give us a guiding star or angel to see things through his eyes in order to do his will. We, the things that we say and do and that happen to us in this life are very important. But they always must be seen in the backdrop of what is going on in God's creation. This backdrop of salvation history. How does this advance the kingdom, uh, both in our hearts and in those, uh, the hearts of those we love? We need to be forever His, living at present in a world that someday will no longer be. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now the uh, next Sunday's Mass, of course, will be uh, the Mass for Christmas. So, uh, we'll have a, there's no procession or anything like that planned as far as I know. I'm not aware of it anyway because uh, it's a good day for family and all, but we'll do our best to make it good. Hopefully the frog will be out of my throat by then, and hopefully uh, all the folks who've been ill can be returned by then. There's a member of our community who would like to bless and thank our faithful servers. This person has provided gift bags to collect donations and gifts until Christmas time. These gift bags are on the blessing table out here in the narthex until Christmas. There are name tags on each bag and for each server, uh, so you can make sure you spread the largesse evenly. I know they'll appreciate it, and I certainly hope they know how much we appreciate them. I think that's it. Needless to say, our Scola and our ladies' choir are going from glory to glory, so keep up the good work, folks.